Thank you for tuning in to the latest edition of the 12 Kyle podcast. Whether you're listening during your commute, while working out, or just relaxing at home, we appreciate you. Every download, every listen, and every subscription means a lot. Up next, the 12 Kyle podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. And thank you for subscribing to the latest edition of the 12 Kyle podcast. I am your boy, 12 Kyle. Man, check this out. On this episode, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little health. Uh, We have a guest who is really not a guest. Uh, She's been on the podcast before. Um, Her last appearance was her first appearance. Uh, She was on the podcast back in April of 2021. So it's been a minute. And uh, when I had her on, we talked about COVID uh, because we were in the height of the COVID pandemic. But uh, we're over the pandemic, I think. And uh, we're bringing her back once again to talk about health, medicine, and every any and everything in between. Um, she is uh, one of my best friends in the Marvel Universe. Uh, she's not my best friend because my wife stole her, and she's now Sharice's best friend. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the second time, the one of the best pediatricians in the world uh, my good friend, your good friend, Dr. Jamel Felder, is back in the j- building. Jamel, what up? Hello, hello. <laughs> You're still my best friend, Kyle. Don't yeah, do that. Yeah, you, you said that on the last episode, but we know better. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Now, was it 21 or was it, um, well, I nope. guess maybe it was after. Yeah, it was 21. It was uh-huh. April 8th, 2021. Okay. Uh, you came on and you talked about COVID and I made some predictions that it was going to be around and that we was going to have to do a yearly vaccine, just like the flu vaccine. You remember that? Yes, you did make those predictions. And while I didn't think it was crazy, it sounded plausible. You were on point. So we can start right there. Um, In the medical field, how has things changed uh, since the pandemic? And now I guess we're what considered, are we at herd immunity now? We're in the post pandemic. Well, I mean, well, as you know, the virus keeps changing, right? So that's the reason why we have to keep getting um, new vaccines. So I think the new newest vaccine um, just was approved by the FDA maybe a week or so ago. Um, so they'll be um, asking people to go out and get your new and improved COVID vaccine as well as getting your flu vaccine. Um, and so why are you shaking your head? <laughs> because I'm not, I'm never taking that flu vaccine and, and, and I don't, I don't want to start to start the podcast off on some foolishness, but I just I, I took the flu vaccine many, many years ago and I got the flu and I've never been that sick ever in my life. Even I got COVID and COVID felt like a very small cold compared to whatever that was, whatever was in that flu vaccine. It did me bad. I was like, I'm never doing this again. So, so let's, just, to... let's just recap, because, I mean, that's mm-hmm. a common myth that some people will say, and I, I think we may have touched on this last time, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, it takes a minute for the um, antibodies to build up. So it's a two-week period, so it takes about two weeks. So if you get the flu vaccine and you're exposed within that two-week period, you can get the flu because you're not fully protected. So a lot of people say that the vaccine gave them the flu. That is not true. But um, yeah, if you get it in a window and you're around a bunch of flu or a bunch of whatever, for that matter, it'd be around monkeypox. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to talk about that because I haven't looked that up too much. (laughs) But um, but but yes, you can you can still succumb to the disease state um, while you're waiting for your antibodies to build up so so but you asked me a question about how yes. is medicine yes how is medicine COVID. changed yes. um well i mean to be honest i think there was a mass exodus from um medicine like clinical medicine to other jobs from nurses um physicians um you know we all you know they called it the great resignation And that happened in all kind of fields, but it happened in medicine as well. Um, And I had my great resignation date on uh, June 9th of 2023. So I no longer am a practicing pediatrician. But you're still top five pediatricians in the world, though. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, thank you for that, Kyle. <laughs> you know, I think you're a little biased, but um, yes, I have since moved on and I'm a medical director for an insurance company. And I also launched my own weight management practice um, in September of last year. So, so I'm, I'm, and I'm also a health equity consultant for my hospital. So I'm doing a couple things. So I left one job for three. So I'm now Jamaican, <laughs> um, but I'm, Not but I, but I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm fulfilled in what I'm doing. So that's the good thing. So let's let's go back to that because again, you were at the last time we spoke, uh, you were you know practicing medicine as far as being a pedi- pediatrician, and you mentioned the exodus. Uh, was it because of COVID or was it just? Was it a myriad of things where you just wanted to get out of the practice altogether? Oh, for me, it was a myriad mm-hmm. of things. Mm-hmm. So, like, um, so uh, let's see, how shall we say it? So, 2020 was the pandemic, and, um, you know, it was pretty rough, especially in those early states. Um, and then there was the misinformation and disinformation. Um, and so, what that does is, just kind of whittle away the trust that you have built with families when people start questioning vaccines, which is everybody's right to question whatever um, you put in your body. Right. Um, But then you start questioning every vaccine um, and you've had older children that you vaccinated without problems, but then you don't want to vaccinate the babies um, and on and such. So, um, so it became those kind of things. And then, um, and then 22, I had um, started business school because I wanted to kind of pivot and, you know, see what the um, administrative side of medicine would bring me and just to learn about the business of medicine since medicine seemed to be more corporate corporatization of medicine. Um, So I wanted to see, you know, learn that part. So in 22, I um, embarked on getting a master's in business administration, which I successfully completed in December of that year. Um, and also you, you did it on December 9th, De- December 9th, your birthday. Yes. Yeah. So you missed, um, <laughs> my, party. You missed, you missed my 50th, but yeah. and, um, you're excused. <laughs> and, um, and also that same year I lost my brother and mother 44 days apart. So for me, um, after that happened, um, and after some things happened with that, just, um, I just didn't feel um, in the second half of my career that I wanted to be in a a clinic somewhere, seeing patients every day, all day. I think I just wanted something different to do. Okay. Okay. You know, what's interesting. I went back and listened to that podcast that we did and both of us, you, you, well, I'm going to go back and then come forward, but both of us, we, we talked about our apprehension in taking the vaccine because I think at the time, I was about to get my second shot. I think you had already had your second shot. I was like within a week of taking my second shot and didn't have any effects of of it, of the uh, COVID vaccine. But um, I just, I chuckled at our exchange because, you know, you're a medical, you're a medical doctor and you were apprehensive about taking the vaccine as well. Um, And you, you talked about a lot of resistance that you experienced as far as patients not wanting to take it. Um, What has been, I know you said you've gotten out of the field, but what has been the, if you could say probably the biggest fallout from the whole vaccine misinformation, uh, them running Dr. Fauci up out of there. Uh, what, what, what has been the biggest thing that you think happened with, with all of that? Well, I think I alluded to it earlier. Like, you know, people, um, the mistrust that you have in medicine also translates to mistrust of doctors and the things that they're telling you. Um, and so there's always more questioning, which I'm saying is fine to do. Um, but you know, like some people like to go on web MD. I won't say anybody <laughs> specifically, but the other I person love talking web MD. on this podcast, you know, and web, I mean, and not to be honest, that's a better site than most, but you know, with the TikTok age and, um, you know, those things there, I think it's eroded the trust in physicians and the things that we tell you. And so um, it's very concerning because, you know, we spend half our lives to get this experience, this education to serve patients. You know, we're not, you know, trying to do some do harm to anyone with the medical advice that we're giving you. 
Um, and so I think it, I think it was more so of eroding that trust that, um, that was kind of there. Um, and I think we lost that. Um, and so now people are really, um, you know, just kind of take what doctors say, you know, sometimes with a grain of salt. I mean, you know, and also I think I call it Burger King medicine. I saw more Burger King medicine where, you know, people want to have it their way. They want to come in and they want to tell you what to prescribe, what tests to run, you know, even if it's unnecessary. Um, And so I think, you know, when you spend a lot of time and effort and um, time of your life, you know, half of your life doing this and then, um, you know, people come in and tell you what you're going to do with your license. That's that's a little bit where I have to draw the line. So, um, <laughs> so you know, I was just like, okay, this 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 part um, uh, is becoming um, less and less satisfying for me. So I need to pivot and do something else. And that's why I got another degree so I could pivot. Do Do you miss anything about? practicing medicine on a daily basis? Um, so my weight management clinic is half a day a week, which they allow us to do at my medical directorship job. Um, so I'm, I'm not out of clinical practice per se. I just mm-hmm. pivoted and I love it. Okay. I love, love, love my current practice. It's mine. I own it. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I just love that specialty. I mean, I think I've been called to that, you know, since I was a pediatrician, I mean, early in my career, I talked out against um, pediatric obesity and educated people. And um, so that's been my passion for a very long time. Um, And so to be able to do that now as my, you know, clinical practice, I absolutely love it. Now, as far as pediatric practice, I do Mm -hmm. miss the babies. Oh my goodness, Mm -hmm. I miss those babies. You know, um, the parents, Mm, not so much but but the babies i miss them and um and when i see them out in walmart or the grocery store wherever you know they they come running some of them some of them be like oh she got a shot in her pocket let me get away from her but um (laughs) it's like that's the shot lady (laughs) (laughs) that's funny so that and that's interesting because I, I know and I'll go back to something you said earlier, um, you know, making that pivot career wise and then going back and getting that degree. And, you know, you went through a lot that year, uh, specifically losing your brother and your mother, uh, like you said, within a 44 day span. Um, how did you push through all that? Because that was, you know, I watched from afar, but we're very close, obviously. So we talk. Um, how did you push through that to not just get the degree, but you know, the purpose behind that, how, how did you push through that to, to, to accomplish the goal? Well, I made my brother a promise. Um, you know, he's very proud of his doctor sister <laughs> and, you know, I hope I don't start crying, but, um, the first, we had residency periods where you go in person, mm-hmm. um, to university of Tennessee, which is where I got my MBA from. And it was a physician executive um, MBA program. So it was all physicians. And um, so I remember the first RP1, residency period one, um, and I was driving up through the mountains. And I wasn't a good driver through the mountains. This was only my second time driving through the mountains. Um, and then I was doing it by myself the first time I was with my husband. But, um, but I was doing it by myself, and it was starting to snow. And I was talking to him on the phone and he said, well, you call me when you get there because I don't want anything to happen to you. And that was the first period. And so I get there and as soon as I get there, um, well, it was threatening to snow and I made it all the way to Tennessee um, through the mountains. And as soon as I like pulled up to the hotel, it started snowing. So I made it there safely. And so I got into my hotel and I videoed some snow for him that it was starting to snow and I sent it to him, called him, told him I made it safe. So he was very proud that I was, again, setting out to do something different. You know, he's always pushed me to, you know, achieve my goals. And so 
he was very proud. And so, you know, it took a long time from him to pass away um, because he just um, basically withdrew care from dialysis. And so it was a kind of drawn out period. And so he um, made me promise that I would finish. Oh, wow. um, he, he knew that was the only way that he was going to get me to do it. And, <laughs> um, and so when I graduated, you know, I um, decorated my graduation cap for for Nard, which is what we called, mm-hmm. that was like his nickname, Nard, N-A-R-D. And so that was on my graduation cap. And I had so many people standing behind me in my MBA class crying at our graduation mm-hmm. ceremony because all they could see was for Nard, you know, as I'm <laughs> standing in front of them um, and I'm crying too. So it was very emotional for me and my class. Um, but, you know, we go through things. It makes us stronger. Um, and And I did it basically to fulfill my promise to him. That's what's up. That's what's up. You know, what's interesting. You and I had a conversation many years ago and I distinctly remember the conversation because I had, I was dropping Dion off at college, my oldest son, your godson. Uh, And I want to say this was his freshman year, but you had mentioned that you wanted to do something with obesity. So you had talked about it Wait, And I think Dion went to college in what, 2017. So you had talked about it back then. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to you now to push this forward, having prophesied something for yourself or set a goal for yourself to be dealing with obesity? Um, well, I'll, I'll just tell you the truth. The, the only reason I'm doing weight management, obesity management is because of my brother, Okay. you know, at his highest weight, he was 465 pounds. Wow. And as a physician and as his sister, more than that, I wasn't able to help him. You know, it, it just made me, um, so frustrated that I wasn't able to help him, um, and sit on the sidelines and watch him, you know, have kidney failure and have heart attacks and, you know, ultimately strokes, which is what his last thing was that ultimately he was like, enough is enough. And I would like to, you know, please let me go home. Um, and that was a beautiful time for people to die with dignity. You know, that's another talk for another day, but you know, um, the reason why um, I'm doing this work is because in medical school, they didn't teach us how to do it. They said calories in equals calories out, move more, eat less. That's the magic golden formula. And we know that just doesn't work. Um, and so because of that, I got real interested in obesity and I went and took a course in um, Harvard. And after the first like, pathophysiology lecture that morning where they were talking about the biochemistry, the um, hormones that make up um, this study of obesity that nobody ever taught us in medical school, not in my medical school, um, and not in a lot of medical schools across the country. I cried. I busted out crying. I know the lady beside me was like, what is wrong with this lady? I know. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is just like any other chronic disorder that we've been mismanaging, telling people to eat less and move more. I mean, I was just so, I was so full because I was like, I finally got the answers that I need to make a difference in this space. And, and it's shameful. I think we have let down um, certainly patients that suffer from obesity, but definitely the medical professionals because we weren't trained. And so now that all the medicines are coming out, you know, everybody jumping in, wanting to give out a GLP one, but they didn't go get their class. <laughs> okay, so what's and they a GLP one? Certified. <laughs> okay, I got to raise my hand. What's a GLP one? Because you start. Oh, GLP one is the Ozempics, okay. the Wagovis, the Zepbounds, the Manjaro. You know, everybody wants to prescribe it, but I will say there's about 8,000 of us in the country that are board certified in obesity medicine. Not saying that any other physician cannot prescribe the medicine. Um, um, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that there is a specialty um, and I'm double board certified as a pediatrician and an obesity medicine specialist. So, um, so, you know, so there's that. Um, and then, so I, so I will have to say that mo- this part of my career is personal to me 
because both my mom and my brother suffered from obesity and they both ultimately passed away from complications of obesity. Mm. And so if I can help any family from going through the losses that I had to go through um, because um, of, you know, the, the failing of the medical medical profession to treat persons with the chronic complex disease of obesity. And that's what it is. I mean, we wouldn't treat cancer any different, you know, hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes. We treat these things. Um, But we somehow think that obesity is someone's fault. And I'm here to say it is not. It's so much more complicated than that. And so with the tools that I learned at Harvard and other courses that I've taken, um, and then sit for an exam and pass and be board certified in that field, um, it's one of the proudest things that makes me still excited about medicine. That's great. That is great. That is great. That is a great story to hear as well. Um, I tell you what, we got time to take a quick commercial break. So after the break, We'll come back on the other side and we'll get more with Dr. Jamel Felder. We'll be back in just a sec. And just like that, we are back. Once again, it's your boy, 12 Kyle. This is the 12 Kyle podcast and we are kicking it and getting a little knowledge from Dr. Jamel Felder. Uh, she's back in the building again, top five pediatrician in the world. Um, even though she's no, no longer practicing medicine. Um, I am so I, still practicing medicine. I'm sorry. You, well, you're not working with the babies no more. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. Weight um, management. So, I want to go back to something you said earlier as far as like, um, you know, just talking about and, and something that you mentioned on the previous episode that we did where we, you talked about uh, as far as like the distrust with um, people as far as, you know, doctors and medicine is concerned. And obviously COVID has heightened everything up. Uh, but one thing you mentioned on that episode was us, people of color, uh, black folks. Uh, mm-hmm. For those of you who are, aren't watching on YouTube, both Dr. Jamel and I are black mm-hmm. in case you hadn't figured it out by now. Um, <laughs> but what, what do you see? What have you seen anything as far as like, um, with obesity and us and just the, um, the struggles that we have in your practices? What, what have you seen so far in, in the time that you've been, you know, working with this, uh, in, in this new endeavor? Well, what I will say is when people come to me, um, they don't know how I'm going to be. They're nervous. They've been <laughs> shamed. They've been made to feel guilty. Um, nobody has taken the time with them to, um, you know, go through some things that I go through. Um, so nervous. They're nervous. And so what I say is that we, you know, people with um, obesity, they have weight stigma that happens through um, healthcare professionals. Um, and I witnessed it firsthand with my brother. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he, you know, is n- not treated nicely sometimes, mm-hmm. um, because of his, uh, excess weight. Um, and I don't think that's just in a silo. I think that happens quite frequently. Um, and patients are made to feel that it's their fault, um, that they're lazy. Like if they just back away from the table, this would magically go away. <laughs> um, we're not sprinkling out, you know, um, potions on people. I was like, things, there are reasons why there's genetics, there's, um, your environment, there's the food that you eat, you know, there is, um, maybe a food desert in your neighborhood. Maybe you don't have access to fresh foods. Maybe they're too expensive. So, I mean, there are a lot of things that play into this complex, um, disease. And I just feel like it's time to, you know, treat every patient with compassion, no matter, you know, what disease process it is, but certainly around obesity, we could do a lot better job. Um, and so I will say that for us, like, but I don't think this is race at all. I think, Mm -hmm. um, some people don't want to, they want a quick fix. So I have a lot of people coming to me and like, I need the shot. (laughs) I'm sorry, baby, your, your insurance ain't gonna pay for the shot. You got a thousand dollars. Okay, well, we're going to do some other things, okay? And so, you know, so I have a lot of tools in my toolkit. You don't have to start out with the GLP ones, which are the shots that everybody are taking. And I I will say this disclaimer while we're talking about the shots. 
There are some compound pharmacies that may be good, may not be good, but I just caution people to make sure that you know what you're putting in your body. And I say that for everything, Um, because some of these fake GLP ones out there are harming folks. Um, They're thinking it's one thing, it's not. Um, People are overdosing on this because um, they're trying to do it not the way they were prescribed to do it or just don't understand how to draw medicine up. And so they overdose, which causes intractable vomiting for weeks sometimes. And you have to be hospitalized and get some fluids. So, I mean, they're not, it's a medicine. So it's not without, um, you know, pros and cons with everything that you put in your body. So I just tell people to just do your research. I know everybody wants to have that thinness, especially especially after you get after a certain age. You know, I'm I'm in the 50 club now Um, and it gets difficult. Um, but you also still have to watch your nutrition. You still have to exercise. Um, you still have to do your mind work. And that's the biggest piece that I tell people. You have to change your mindset about food. And if you don't do that, you can take, you can take pills, you can take shots, you can go get bariatric surgery. But if you don't change the mindset that you have with food and your relationship with food, you will gain the weight back every single time. So what do you say to those who, you know, they love, I don't know, lemon pepper wings and they just can't get away from it. It just be calling them, you know, like, like Pookie on New Jack City. Everybody has that thing. Not, I mean, mine is golden Oreos. Um, What? Yes. Every (laughs) golden Oreos. That's my thing. Wow, I never, never knew that golden Oreos existed. Yeah. So the other ones, they're yellow. And then they got the cream in the middle, the golden Oreo. So those are my favorite. But so everybody has their thing. Everybody has their, you know, their favorite thing. Mm -hmm. And I tell people you can have your favorite thing. I I don't, I don't believe in um, keeping away from certain things. You can have everything in moderation, Um, you know, but I also talk to people. We talk about food triggers. We talk about stress. Um, a lot of people emotionally eat. So we talk about that. Um, so I, I give people tools. We sit there and analyze why we got to where we got. Um, we talk about the history over the course of a life. So when was the first time that you had excess weight on your body? If it was elementary school and you're now coming to me in 40, we got a lot of mind work to do, right? Mm-hmm. Which I don't do because I'm not a counselor. So they got to go <laughs> see the counselor, Right. But I give them tools, you know, until they can get to the counselor. So I I just really want people to know that there are um, physicians out here who care, especially about our community, because um, we are the ones dying the most because of the excess weight. We're also the least likely to get the medicines, the referrals to the places that we need to be. Um, I tell people it's Band-Aid medicine where they keep you coming back for your diabetes and hypertension, but they're not helping you fix the root cause of that. And sometimes it's your excess weight because we know if people get on these medicines, the GLP ones, the shots that a lot of them get off their diabetes medicines. A lot of them Mm -hmm. get off their high blood pressure medicines because it is attributable, attributable to their excess weight. So these medicines are great. Um, we in obesity medicines world, we super excited about them because they rival the same weight loss, um, as some, as bariatric surgery in a shot. And so that is like revolutionary. So we're so excited about that. And there are more medicines being developed. So they're, you know, they're the, the dailies first, they were dailies and now they're weekly injectables. Um, first, there was one hormone that it targeted. Now it's they were the second ones are two, and then there's one coming that's gonna target three. So I mean, we get we're getting it. We get right. we're getting it. So I'm just super excited that you know I get to be um, in the in the fight with my patients to help them with their excess weight. Yeah, you you mentioned the, the G. What well, you said, GLP one. Yeah, GLP. Okay. Oh, look at you. See, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes over here. I'm taking notes. So the GLP. So is it is it frustrating at all to to because i know that there's a push i mean like you can be watching tv and you hear the ozempic commercial i'm and that's the only reason why i'm familiar with ozempic is because 
I watch the nightly news and it comes on every single night during a commercial break. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not lying. Yeah. It's for real. Yeah. It does. And so how, how is it, is it frustrating because like, are there some people who may want kind of that quick fix of, Hey, I'll take this shot. I'm going to drop 35 pounds after taking this shot. And that's not really. Oh, well, I always tell people this isn't a magic pill. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not a magic shot either. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you, I mean, up to, so if you look at the thing and then you read the little fine print, (laughs) (laughs) right, right, up to, but it also says each individual, you know, uh, is, is up to the individual. So they can't guarantee that for every individual. So I have people coming to me and it's like, Oh, I got a wedding at the end of the year and I want to lose 30 pounds by December. And I was like, "Mm, that may not be possible. Um, you just have to be realistic, you know, we could get you there. Um, but sometimes as again, the insurance companies are not paying for these medicines, a lot of them. And so then people go to the compound pharmacies and then a lot, a lot, a lot on down the line. And let me just be clear. The reason why the compound pharmacies are able to do this, um, make this supposed medicine and we're not sure if it's the same, right? Is because there's a shortage. So okay. anytime there's a shortage, a compound pharmacy can um, try to produce the same um, medicine as the shortage. And that's the only reason that we're in that predicament. Um, because the medicine took off like gangbusters. You know, everybody in Hollywood, you know, they want to slim down <laughs> for their roles. Um, and they can afford it, right? They're the elite. So they get it, you know, mm-hmm. with no problems because they can afford it. They can pay $1,000 a month for you know, Ozempic or whatever. It's, it's no skin off their back. For me, um, it's absolutely necessary that we try to um, make this more widely available to people who are more vulnerable and have more health problems. And that's usually your Medicaid, and your Medicare population, which at this point, um, and it's state by state, but like in my state of South Carolina, they're not covering these medicines okay. on Medicaid or Medicare. So um, they covered it briefly. I think that's about the end in October for there was a new indication for Regovi that came out for um, um, major um, adverse cardiovascular events or hearts. We called it MACE. Um, hmm. So if you had a previous stroke or previous heart, heart attack, these medicines were indicated to... to um, be tried to help prevent your, you know, that from occurring again. And so I did get one of my Medicaid patients on it after she had had a stroke, but you know, we need to be getting it on (laughs) in the patients before they have strokes. That would be ideal, (laughs) way more than ideal to have to wait till after someone gets a stroke to get the medicine approved is ridiculous as far as I'm concerned, but we have to jump through the hoops that, um, that we have. And so I try to help patients, um, you know, and she had lost weight on an de- uh, a oral medication called metformin um, prior to even being on that um, before her stroke. So she had lost 30 pounds prior to her stroke. So it was just that she still had excess weight um, and had already done harm to her body. Um, but, but we want to prevent that. And it's many people, um, especially me in, in, in marginalized, underserved populations, I mean, really is my heart. And so, um, so hopefully we can, could start getting that work done. Now you mentioned, uh, comp- compound pharmacies. Is that like the CVS's and no, no, no. Okay. They're usually like other pharmacies, like your, your mom and pop. Okay. Some of those are compound pharmacies. They're specific. Um, and I don't want to be on here and like down in compound. No, pharmacy I, I know because, what you mean. Um, but because there are some legitimate safe ones. Um, but overall, the uh, BCD Medicine Association um, but does not recommend the use of compounds, um, compounded um, semaglutide, which is Wigovi and Ozempic. Okay, now you can't use big words on me now. Semaglutide <laughs> is just the generic, the, the generic name, I'm the brand with name, you. so Ozempic and I'm messing with um, you. Wigovi. So what about, okay, so the demographic for the people that listen to this podcast is usually somewhere between 30 and 55, 60, right? Mm -hmm. So our peers in a lot Mm -hmm. of ways. Um, What do you tell the person who is, uh, you know, putting on that shirt or putting on that dress 
and they're like, okay, they, they got their eye on uh, a date in November because it's their college homecoming and they want to look fly and they know that they got to drop 10 pounds. Mm-hmm. What do you tell them as far as like, you know, trying to get weight down? What what is there any advice that you would give as far as, uh, you know, to, to try to make that happen? Basically losing 10 pounds in two months. Um, so safe weight loss is two pounds a week has always been what it is. And so, um, and the body adjusts better to that. Um, some people lose more weight than that on these medicines. Um, but I tell my people, let's go slow and just, you know, and so I will say that let's just talk about female versus male. (laughs) So, because there's a, a hormonal component to uh, weight loss in women um, that after you get to perimenopause and menopause states, that is very difficult to lose weight. Mm-hmm. You can do whatever you try, but your hormones work against you. And so some people get on hormone replacement in order to keep their kind of weight in check and not have the other side effects such as um, hot flashes and all the other things that come with menopause. Um, but um, so and the other thing is, you know, some of these medicines, right? Um, not everybody wants to get on medicines and I'm not a medicine, you know, that's just one tool in the toolbox is mm-hmm. what I tell people. I mean, basically what we do is we come up with a comprehensive plan. So we talk about sleep, we talk about stressors, we talk about, um, nutrition, we do it all. How much exercise are you doing? So I kind of... Figure out what you do as a person, you know, and then we figure out what are some goals that you can have. So if you're telling me that you drink 20 Mountain Dews every day because you stay up till four o'clock, um, <laughs> then obviously the first goal is Stop let's cut Mountain back Dews. on the Mountain Dews and let's get more sleep. So a, a lot of it is not pushing medicines. A lot of it is saying, what is it that you can do to change some of the habits that you've um, accumulated over your course of living that are not healthy. And so my, my clinic is called new wellness, new creation wellness. And so it's not just about your weight. It's really about wellness, you know, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, the whole nine. And so we talk about all of that, you know, and all of the different ways that you can be healthier. And so it's not just a, a, it's not really a weight loss. I don't like to call it that. I mean, I call it weight management because I'm okay. helping you manage your weight, but I'm also talking to you about all your other um, things that you're doing in your life that may be causing you to struggle with your weight. Okay. So what about in the same scenario, what about that person that wants to lose that 10 pounds within two months and they're not taking any medicines? They want to, you know, just go to the gym and, you know, kind of starve themselves so they can get into that dress or get into that shirt for homecoming. I mean, so intermittent fasting, people do that, and that's very successful. Um, I tell people it's not really sustainable over the long haul. Um, So you could do that, you know. Um, I've done a lot of these things over the course of my life. Every every person who struggled with their weight that goes up and down, you've done a lot of things. And so a lot of people know what works for them. But at some point, um, (laughs) if you are a woman, and sometimes as a man, you get to this point where the things that you've done in the past, they don't seem to work. And so starving yourself, of course, is not something that I recommend, but I do recommend a high protein diet. If you're trying to lose weight, you know, cut down on your sugars, cut down on your um, soft drinks. So we, we do, I mean, there are some things you can do. Um, I just, you know, and to, and to move and to build muscle, right? So if you're going to go and do weight training, which is very important for women, um, over 50 for them to do that changes their body more than cardio cardio is very important i'm not saying that it's not important Mm -hmm. but you get more of a change in your body um if you build more muscle and i'm not saying like be a you know weightlifter muscle i'm just saying (laughs) that if you have more muscle then you can tone easier and your weight loss goals are more sustainable and it seems easier than if you're just doing cardio alone so that is one trick that I will say for perimenopausal, uh, menopausal women, res- resistance training is going to change your body more than cardio. But do your cardio because you need a, a healthy heart. So, 
That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, I, I think you you've touched on a lot of different things, and and it's it's been it's amazing to hear because like, I think especially as we get older, you know, our bodies change, mm-hmm. and we we see ourselves, and you know, everybody knows that, you know, you you have your before and after because like we looked a certain way in our twenties, and we're gonna look a certain way in our fifties, and so like you always want to compare yourself to the past, especially women more so, maybe probably more so than men because they're constantly being compared to their past. Uh, have you come across in, 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 in the wellness part, it, have you gotten like a lot of resistance from any of your patients or have they pretty much just kind of bought in? Oh, my patients come to me skeptics. They come <laughs> to me as skeptics. They was like, oh, I done been doing this my whole <laughs> life, lady. What you offering, I ain't buying. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when they start losing their weight, they was like, oh my gosh, I have one patient in particular she thought I was selling her a, a she she did not buy it. She was like, This is not gonna work. <laughs> you know, I don't believe you. You know, I've been doing this, I've been struggling with this my whole 47 years of living. This is not gonna work. And it worked. And mm. so it's not about the medicines per se, it's about helping her change her mindset. So if you're going around calling yourself the F word, which I will not say, okay. um, because I don't allow my patients to say it and <laughs> i don't i'm talking about no that's not I, I know i'm messing with you yeah yeah if we're talking about weight you know what the f word is i'm right. talking about yeah we i don't allow them to, so if you're going around in your household and you're calling yourself that day in and day out that was one of the things she said to me in our first intake she kept saying that over and over i was like okay the first thing we're gonna do is take that out of your vocabulary i don't mm. let people use that word i said you can't use that word around me and she was like taken aback. And I was just like, no, no, no. We have to shift our mindset. So if you're going to call yourself that, that has been a negative, you know, voice in your head saying that word over and over and over again. I said, nothing's going to change if you're going to continue to say that. Yeah. She stopped saying it. And that lady lost 30 pounds. Wow. And so it wasn't just that. You know, we did some other things. We talked about our diet, you know, some of the same things that I'm saying, you know, to you. But it was mainly looking at herself differently, that you can be different. I don't care if you've been like this your whole life and that 47, you're meeting me and you want to make a change. If you're serious about it, I'll help you. But you also have to change your mindset. You can't keep saying the same things to yourself and looking at yourself in the mirror, saying those same things that you've said to yourself since you were 10 years old. It won't work. And so nobody ever talked to her about shifting her mindset Mm -hmm. away from thinking negative thoughts. So she would replay the negative tapes in her mind all the time. No, you're not going to be successful. You keep looking at yourself in the mirror saying the same thing that you said all your life. You've got to say other things about yourself. I say you don't have anything nice to say about yourself. When you look in the mirror, don't say anything. Don't use the F word and just, you know, fake it till you make it. You know, (laughs) I am doing the best I can. I'm happy about my hair today. You know, give yourself something positive. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't necessarily have to look in the mirror and lie to yourself if you don't feel like you look beautiful. Because that also is self-love and you also that's a process. So, you know, we just started small. And I told that one thing I think changed her life. Stop saying the F word. Wow. F A T people, because I'm not talking about the other word. Yeah, we know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) We know you ain't talking about the other F word. (laughs) <laughs> that's funny that, but that that's that's good but and, and like you said it starts with a mindset i mean like you 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 are what you what you think you are mm-hmm. you know some people look in the mirror and say hey i'm i'm gonna be great today some people mm-hmm. say i'm not gonna be great i'm mm-hmm. i'm a bum you know and mm-hmm. you you slowly become what what it is that you think that you are mm-hmm. um one more question before i get you out of here uh let, let's let's pivot a little bit from um uh med- med- medicine in the medical field um, you are a huge sports fan. Um, you attended and are a proud alum of Duke University. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, what, what do you think y'all gonna do this year as far as basketball is concerned? Well, I don't know. We got some good recruits, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think. Um, <laughs> 
I don't know what all I should say, but I just went real happy with Coach Shire. I just, I, I just. I think a lot of Dukies weren't real happy with him. You know, he just like a give little him time. Like, give him time. You know, he's like the like friendly coach. Like you, sometimes you got to get in people's, you know, something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You got to get in their face. You got to motivate them. That's not his motive. That's not his style. I think he's like the friendly coach, and he's just you know, add a boy type thing. And we really want to win. Okay, so let's. I mean, as long <laughs> if he, um, you know, but you know, um, Coach Davis at UNC, you know he needed some time to kind of get the, his legs, see legs mm-hmm. and they've, you know, actually come out. And so, you know, we're going to give him some more time. We're going to give him, get his, let him get see legs under him. Cause you know, we used to win it, you know, coach K was with that's us, what with, I, that's you what know, I heard. yeah. So we used to win and we, we, we got to get back there, you know, and it's our hundredth, you know, year of Duke and, you know, we, we, we want to show out, want to show up and show out, you know, we're not trying to, you know, <laughs> Be low down in them poles now. Wait a minute. So it's a hundred years of Duke University, a hundred years of Duke basketball. Hundred years of Duke University. Wow. Okay. It's our Didn't centennial know. year. Didn't know that. You, mm. you going to homecoming this year? Well, I don't know. You know, we'll see. I, I I have it on my radar, but I've had a little health issue, so I have to figure out if that's um, something that I can do. That's you know, and and it's amazing. I still laugh at the fact that you went to Duke football games, but never made it to a Duke <laughs> basketball game. I'm not a camp out person. <laughs> I'm not camping out for anything. <laughs> and, and, just, and just so you know, those, those of you listening, she was there like when Duke was dope, when Duke we had Grant Hill and, and Bobby Hurley and all these other guys, <laughs> the championship teams, and she never made it to a basketball game. Um, and we're, we're also in a fantasy football uh, league, um, our families. Um, I, 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 I was blown away. I'm not gonna lie. I was blown away by the fact that I, I had no. See, here's the thing. I've known we've known each other forty plus years, mm-hmm. and so I, I I knew you were competitive. I didn't know you was that competitive. I mean, like I said last night, when I when you text me at eleven thirty, and I know you go to bed dumb early, for you to text me at eleven thirty on a Monday night. Yeah, I'm just watching the game. I got to make sure I win tonight. I'm like Jamel, you do know you you can get the results in the morning. Like you got to go to work in the morning. What, what 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 are you looking forward to as far as fantasy football? So you know we have this my my son Kyle's godson um, Lakeo started this fantasy league for us last year just so we could have some family fun, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's been great. So this year I'm looking forward to um, taking my team at least to the to the you know playoffs. I I, I you know I don't know we we'll, we'll see. You know I got I had the number one pick so <laughs> Christian McCaffrey may take me there. Um, but we'll see. Um, I, I, I really honestly, though, just like the fellowship and us just kind of being close over football. And so I'm not really a football person. My thing is college sports. So I hosted the March Madness thing. So I'm really doing this as a I'll do fantasy, but y'all going to do March Madness as well. So um, but I'm getting excited about fantasy because I'm I'm going I'm to whip y'all's tail this year. <laughs> Wait a minute. Who, who won the March Madness? Who won that? Um, my dad won okay, March okay. Madness. Yeah, I was out of it real quick, and yeah. I, now I came in second in, in the fantasy football last. Yes, you did. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> let's let's recognize you know true talent, and so we had our at the time of this recording we had our final uh, fantasy football draft last night. So, um, season is upon us, and um, you know I'm looking forward to it too. And and the cool thing is this is the only league that I'm playing in, so I can devote all in years past I played in. Uh, multiple leagues, and like you said, if Lakel had not said, "Hey, I want you to play," I would have. I was like, when he asked me, I was like, "Man, I ain't trying to play," because I was right. done playing fantasy football. But this was fun, so yeah. you know, I was in church checking my rosters and all kind of stuff like that, not paying attention to the pastor. And so, <laughs> so, so I, I'm looking forward to um, I'm looking forward to uh, this year. But uh, as we wrap things up, I want to thank you for coming back on. Um, this has been it, it's been a great journey. Uh, as a friend watching you, because like I said, you did, you know, prophesize this back in 2017 of what you were going to do. Um, so I'll give you the floor to kind of tell us if you have anything, what's next? Cause I know that this is, this is your baby right now. What, what, what do you think is next for the, for the next five years as far as you in this practice? Um, so I think that I want to, um, 
So the job that I have kind of pays the bills. It's, it's not really my passion, um, but it's something that was necessary. And so it's a remote job. My child is a, a middle schooler. And so I can take him to school and pick him up and do that flexible thing, be it to track me that five, like the crazy <laughs> mama, you know. And so and he, I feel like middle school is where I needed that kind of attention. Um, and I just felt like I wanted to give him that kind of attention. Middle school was tough for me. Um, and so I, I just really, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of be in a place where I could give him some 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 me and so I said I was going to devote a three years while he was in medical school to this medical directorship and then try to grow my business try to work more in my practice of weight management and so um you know that's what kind of mommies do we try you know we try to juggle everything and try to and I'm not saying daddies don't do that either I'm just saying the same um you know but we you know <clears throat> y'all are different all the ladies know what I'm saying, okay? <laughs> All the ladies know. So anyway, uh, as I was saying, um, so I just really wanted to kind of give him that time. And then he'll be driving. And then I, I won't have to be the taxi, you know, person. <laughs> you know, I'll just meet him up at the track meet. So, um, so yeah, so that I, that's what I really wanted to do. And then also kind of, um, you know, do some other things. So we didn't get to talk about... Um, my health equity advisory task force that I lead at my oh, hospital. Feel free to talk about it. Um, so basically because um, underserved and marginalized communities are um, represented in most of the health disparities, um, I created a task force at my hospital, convened it, and I lead it. And we um, tackle certain initiatives. It's physicians only in the task force, and we have different specialties and we come up with initiatives based on the data at our hospital. So our first initiatives were lung cancer screenings. We increased those. Our biggest initiative was our maternal infant health initiative, which we're going to launch next month. Okay. Um, took us a whole year to, well, a year and a half to kind of figure out what we wanted to do and get our stuff together. We got some grant funding. And so we have hired, we call them perinatal navigators. Um, to have race concordant, meaning a black um, community health worker, to work with a mom from time she's pregnant to mm -hmm. one year postpartum to kind of help support her through her pregnancy. So we're super excited about that. And then looking ahead, we're going to try to do the same thing with end of life care. So we struggle sometimes in the um, minority populations with death and how to do that with dignity and also making sure that everybody's wishes are understood and um, put out on paper. We don't do that very well um, in our in our communities. And so we want to have an end of life um, doula or navigator to kind of help families navigate those conversations that should have occurred before, you know, but didn't. And so we're working on that. I'm super excited about that. That's one of my favorite upcoming initiatives and then we're going to work about breast cancer and um, heart attack care so I mean so I have been like I said I gave up pediatrics but I am doing the work that makes me my heart still flutter mm -hmm. um, so fighting against disparities um, in marginalized and underserved communities as well as helping people manage their weight in a more compassionate um, integrative way um, I can't ask for anything more as far as my medical career right now. That's dope. That's dope. And and you're a track mom. <laughs> and I'm a track mom. Yes. <laughs> a fantasy football player and a track mom. Uh, well, I got to say again, thank you for coming on. Um, of course, we talk all the time. Uh, I don't talk to you as much because your BFF is taking. Uh, and, and, and for those of you listening and watching, thank you for watching on YouTube. I appreciate it. Uh, my wife, Sharice, is has officially taken over like like me and Dr. Jamel were best friends and she just kind of pushed me out the side. So so we're not we're not we don't talk as much. You know, we He's telling y'all stories. They, they, we talk. they talk every day. Like no, we, we, we talk maybe, you know, and but I you know, over the last year I learned a lot. You know, I did and I'm not gonna get into it, but I did not know you were a fan of a certain rapper from Canada. Um <laughs> so 
our discussions have been very broad these last few weeks. Um, but no, but in all seriousness, no, I, I am super excited for you. I know that the sky's the limit because uh, you've talked about it and, and all of the things that you've always talked about uh, always seem to come to fruition, even when you don't see it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I got to thank you again for coming on. Um, and we will have you back on. It won't be three years. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize it had been three years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to um, congratulate you. And, uh, and and I look forward to I look forward to the text messages uh, this football season. I know they're coming. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. And, um, you know, you've been a friend of mine since I was four years old. And so I don't take that lightly. Um, and yes, Sharice and I talk uh, a little bit Maybe. more, but we've had a lot of conversations here in the last 2024. So we've been doing better. And that's all you do. You know, you only have um, this one life and we are supposed to do better. When we know better, we do better. And yep. I feel like we've been doing better. So. Yeah, we have been, because you've been doing better. <laughs> and on that note, people, <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> and it ain't even my podcast. Yeah, it's not my podcast. <laughs> Listen, you guys, thank you for checking out and, and tapping into the latest edition of the 12 Kyle Podcast. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. You can find the podcast on every podcast reader out there. Uh, if you're on YouTube, you can watch on YouTube as well. Subscribe. We have both audio and video there as well. Uh, if you are on social media, you can follow me at 12 Kyle. Also, 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 I have a new baby. I have a new baby, not literally, not figuratively, but I do have a new baby. It's called the rap soul podcast and it is out right now. There are new episodes. Uh, it's the intersection of, uh, what I call rap and soul music from the eighties, nineties and the two thousands. So if you're a music fan, definitely tap into that. Uh, and also last thing, if you uh, would like to support the podcast financially, uh, hit us up on cash app dollar sign T W E L V E K Y L E. And also you can drop, you can look in the uh, comment section. There's a merch link, click merch link, and you can get 12 Kyle podcast t-shirts, hoodies, mugs. We got it all at the low price. Uh, so that's going to do it for us. So for Dr. Jamel Felder, I am your boy, 12 Kyle. We'll catch you guys next time. Bye. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the 12 Kyle podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you hit the subscribe button and share this podcast with a friend who needs the 12 Kyle podcast in their life. Every listen, every download, and every share helps us grow. Thanks for being a part of the 12 Kyle podcast community. We appreciate your support. We will catch you next time. 5,000.